My name is Kelly Tillman. I am the soybean entomologist at SDSU. And the idea was to have a beautiful backdrop of soybeans behind me, but since the wagon stopped this way, we'll just go without the backdrop and you can just look at me. So I'm going to be fairly brief today. Uh, I would like to tell you, first of all, about a couple of insect pests in soybean that are sort of new or emerging that we might start to see in South Dakota pretty soon. It's not really a big problem here yet, but I feel like it's on the horizon for a variety of reasons, and I just want to give you a heads up about it. Let's do Japanese beetle. Okay, Japanese beetle. Not to be confused with Asian lady beetle. Some people uh, think Asian lady beetle is Japanese beetle. They're actually two different things. Asian lady beetle is the uh, sort of yellow to orangish lady beetle that gets into our houses in the fall and does a lot of good in the agricultural fields during the rest of the year eating aphids for us. Japanese beetle is something completely different. This is a big, about as big as one of my fingernails, uh, green and tan shiny beetle. Uh, you can't miss it once you've seen it very handsome beetle. This beetle has been in the country, uh, started out on the East Coast since about 1916. So even though it's not native to the U.S., it's uh, been here quite a while. I'm going to pass this around now. The reason why this is an emerging pest for our area is that this has been slowly spreading westward over the past several decades. We do have it in South Dakota. The South Dakota Department of Agriculture runs a trapping program and they have discovered around uh, most of the major urban centers in South Dakota. Well, why urban centers? Uh, this is a very broad food range insect. It eats over 300 different plants and it often shows up first in horticulture and home garden type settings. And it particularly likes rose bushes. So far this doesn't sound so bad, but uh, it also likes soybeans quite well, and it likes to feed on corn silk. It uh, has gotten to the point in some of our neighboring states where it is occasionally an economic problem in corn and soybean. Uh, in soybean, it is a, more of a problem because it chews holes in leaves, and if you get enough of them and enough defoliation, uh, it's just like any other chewing pest, it's going to harm the plant. Uh, Illinois has uh, had problems with Japanese beetle in soybean and corn for a number of years. Iowa has started to have economic problems. Nebraska has had an increasing number of calls to their entomologists about Japanese beetle in soybean. And as I said, we do have it in the state. And uh, so it's possible within the next few years we're going to have populations that are built up to the point where we're going to start uh, having them on our radar screen as a crop pest in this state. So this is just a little heads up for you. The good news is um, there are registered pesticides for them. It's a problem that can be managed. They tend to start out around field edges first. So if you're vigilant uh, in your fields, it's pretty easy to catch them and uh, take care of them with an edge treatment before things get out of control. But uh, uh, this is something I think we're going to have to be aware of in the future. Thank you, Daryl. Brown marmorated stink bug. Has anyone heard of brown marmorated stink bug? This is another emerging pest. And Daryl, could you hang on? I'm going to point out a couple of things. This, uh, has been found, uh, let me back up a moment, it is uh, an introduced pest from Asia that's been in this country for maybe a little over a decade and has become a, a really relevant pest on the East Coast in fruits, vegetables, and field crops, including corn and soybean. In fact, it's sort of the emerging big problem on the East Coast, particularly in the Middle Atlantic region. Uh, this is a good hitchhiker. It gets into cars and it goes across the country and it's spreading very rapidly around the country. It has been found in all the states surrounding South Dakota. Not necessarily big established populations, but they have found individuals in Nebraska, in Iowa, in Minnesota, not sure about North Dakota. 
So I'm pretty sure that it has crossed our border, so we just haven't happened to detect it yet. The question is, how long will it take before it establishes the kind of populations that are actually going to do economic harm? Now, we do have some stink bug species in the state that look similar to this that aren't really a problem. This one is different in that the very distinctive triangular notches all around the edge of it is a very distinctive sign of this particular stink bug species. And I'm going to pass that around. Does it smell like a skunk? They do stink. Yes, they do, actually. Uh, the, this family of insects um, has defensive compounds. So when you mess with them, they'll squirt out these chemicals that smell bad, like a skunk, to try to ward off the predator. These are the two species that are um, already found in South Dakota. One is the brown stink bug, which uh, does feed on soybeans. And in the southern U.S. is a problem in soybeans. But you can find it here, but I've never seen an economic population. And then the other similar looking stink bug is the spined soldier bug. This one is actually a beneficial. It is a predator on other insect species. And we have that here as well. Both of these species lack that very distinctive triangular pattern around the abdomen. And they also have very pointy shoulders. It almost looks like you could prick yourself on their shoulders, whereas the brown marmorated kind of a more rounded appearance. These feed on the brown marmorated stink bug feeds on the seed pods or on the corn kernels and shrinks them down to just little pebbly nothings. And uh, it's also a domestic pest on the East Coast where it's very abundant. It gets into houses in the fall, sort of like Asian lady beetle, but they're a lot uglier and meaner looking and people kind of freak out. So that's the other pesthood of them. But that's another thing that it's definitely has been found in the region. And I think sometime within the next few years, it's going to be something we're a little bit more aware of as well. And I'm always looking for that first specimen. So if you think you find one, uh, give me a call or drop me an email. Kelly Tillman in Plant Science Department at SDSU. OK, two more things I'm going to mention very briefly. That uh, soybean aphid, I'm expecting it to be a much more, uh, much more of a problem this summer than it was last summer. Last summer, you could hardly find soybean aphids in soybean. This summer, we already have populations uh, that we've seen that are already at economic threshold levels in early July. That's very unusual. We also have a lot of fields that we monitor that have very high infestation rates. There's not a lot of aphids per plant, but maybe 70, even 80% of the plants in the fields have aphids on them. And th those are the kinds of fields that can really pop. So I'm just really encouraging people this year not to sit back and uh, be complacent about this. This is a good year to start scouting soybeans pretty much now because we've already seen some economic populations in the state and the eastern part of the state. So uh, I don't know if it's going to be a horrible aphid year, but it's definitely a year where early vigilance is a good idea. Any questions about that before I move on to my final topic? Is that blue dragonfly looking thing, is that guy eat aphids or does he eat beetles? Blue dragonfly, um, okay. if it's a dragonfly, then um, they tend to eat uh, any types of insects they find on the wing. Uh, they're especially fond of things like mosquitoes or moths, so they're, they're beneficial. Uh, they probably don't eat uh, a whole lot of aphids in general, because aphids tend to be pretty plant-bound. But uh, dragonflies are uh, uh, actually pretty good at helping to keep mosquito populations a little bit down. And a year like this, the mosquitoes are just, I'm sure you've noticed, pretty bad this year with the moisture that we had. And my uh, colleague, Bu Young Hadi, who is the uh, person who does the medical and the urban uh, entomology with our department, tells me that um, uh, they think there's a pretty high incidence of uh, West Nile virus being carried by mosquitoes this year. So this is a extra good year to be good with the insect repellent and to try to protect yourself from too many mosquito bites this year. Other questions before I move on to the last topic? 
Last topic. Uh, my colleague, Ada Shapanich, is the other extension entomologist in our department who does field crops. I mostly handle soybeans. She handles wheat and corn and sometimes sunflower, but she couldn't be here today, so she asked me to touch on uh, some issues we're having this year with aphids in wheat. How many of you uh, grow some wheat? Okay, most people here. How many of you uh, have had some trouble with aphids this year? I'm seeing several hands go up. We have had a lot more calls than typical this year on aphids in wheat, in particular English grain aphid is the species we've been seeing the most of, which is kind of unusual. It's, you know, it's always here in the state, but it's usually not the thing that we're getting the most calls about. So this year is a little bit unusual. I'm just going to touch briefly on the three main aphid species we see on wheat in South Dakota. We've got your green bug, bird cherry oat aphid, and then the English grain aphid, which we're getting a lot of calls about right now. Pretty easy to tell them apart. Green bug has a green stripe up their back. Bird cherry oat, this is a big aphid. They are all the same size on this, uh, on this poster here, but if you actually see them in the flesh, they're sort of a big, hardy looking aphid. Very uh, typical mark of having these brownish patches at the end of the rear here. That's bird cherry oat aphid. And then English grain aphid, the most distinguishing characteristic of this, it has very dark legs. And all aphids have cornicles, tailpipes coming out the end, but this has really big, dark black tailpipes. These aphids uh, start out feeding on the leaves of wheat, but then when heading starts, they move up and feed very actively in the heads. Uh, this year, we're, as I said, we're getting a lot of calls about English grain in particular. Uh, you probably can't see the threshold chart here, but there's a handout up in the garage on um, both tables. There is a uh, extension handout on weeds and aphid that has management guidelines. So if you don't have one already, um, go ahead and pick up one of those. Uh, the, the main thrust of the, uh, our control recommendations, if 85% of your stems have aphids on them, regardless of how many, but if 85% of your stems have aphids, it's a good time to treat. Uh, getting a little more specific, uh, if you're in the seedling stage, we have our three different aphid species here. 15 to 30 aphids, depending on what aphid species you're looking at, in the seedling stage, good time to treat. If you're between boot to heading, let's just look at English grain aphid. You can actually have a fair number of aphids, 50 aphids per plant, per stem, and that is the treatment threshold for English grain aphid. If it's green bug, 25, we're talking boot to heading, and bird cherry oat, 30. However, those numbers drop way down once you get into the flowering stage. If you're in flowering and you're looking at English green aphid, you can only tolerate five aphids per stem. Whereas for the other two species, green bug and bird cherry oat, you can tolerate 25 to 30. As I said, those English green aphids get down into the head and really actively feed there, so they are, they are a problem. Uh, milky ripe or milk to medium dough stages. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on English grain aphid. You can tolerate 10 aphids per stem under those conditions. So not, not a whole lot, really. There are um, several products that are registered uh, for treatment of these aphids within uh, two weeks. So we're starting to... <coughs> consider harvest time. Uh, you have a two-week pre-harvest interval with several products. Uh, three examples of products with a two-week window. Pencap M, Mustang Max, and Respect are three of the uh, two-week uh, products that can be used against these aphids. I'm going to put this poster up in the barn so you can get a closer look and there's a handout that has all of this information on it. So if you don't already have one, grab it on the way out. So that's all I got. Any other questions for me? Thank you, Daryl. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.